This episode was supposed to be about the Model A. We were gonna fire it up this week for the first time in who knows how long, but we hit a snag, just like every other time I work on it, I swear. But we're pivoting, we have to, we're waiting on parts. What else can we get done in the shop? Well, you guys have been asking in every comment section, when are you working on the Audi? What's going on with it? Why haven't we seen more, et cetera, et cetera. Well, today we're gonna get something done, even if it's not a big milestone, We've got suspension to put on this thing. We've got coilovers, control arms, subframes, and I want to 3D scan the nose of this thing so we can start designing a sport quattro front end conversion. It all counts towards the finished product, even if we're still waiting on the engine. So let's get started. Admittedly, it's been way too long since our last Audi episode, but we're finally diving back in. This time we're working on the suspension, and for those that don't remember, from the shocks to the subframes, we pulled all of the running gear off of this car, but we're gonna be replacing it. Everything we need was sourced from a later model Coupe Quattro. And thankfully, America's favorite Audi nut, Brian Scotto, had all this stuff lying around for the taking. The reason we're upgrading is that the early 90s Audi Coupe Quattro is relatively similar underneath, but it features updated and revised parts for nearly every component. Things like ball joints and wheel bearings are simply unavailable for the original Quattro, and by upgrading, we'll get a newer design and parts availability. Once we got our parts back to the shop, we pulled everything apart. While we probably could have just bolted this stuff on and sent the car on down the road, I want everything to be perfect. And as you can see, this stuff is far from it. So I called upon my friends at Motorsport Powder Coating here in Southern California, and they took care of everything. Our subframes came back looking better than new. Their attention to detail carried over to our control arms as well. Every thread and bushing and bearing surface was kept clean for assembly, while everything else was a perfect shade of black. And that, my friends, is more or less where our Audi suspension build left off. I hate to admit it, but ever since, the car has been collecting dust. I haven't even touched it. But we were a bit preoccupied with the Ferrari. In the time since our last episode, we went to Australia and raced it, brought it home, raced it again, blew it up, and we built an E30 in the meantime but we've been crossing projects off the list and now it's time to get this thing under the knife once again. The last hurdle we crossed was pressing the bearings out of our replacement knuckles, but these knuckles have been sent out to Motorsport Powder Coating and they too are back and look better than ever. Along with our restored knuckles, we've got brand new wheel bearings for all four corners and thankfully, unlike the original parts, these are available. They were also on clearance, so only about 20 bucks each and that is awesome. And so it's on over to the Arbor Press to get these bearings installed in our knuckles. For me, it's always a delicate balance to make sure the bearing doesn't go in sideways, kink, lock into place, and create all sorts of issues. But thankfully, the rear bearings dropped into place without a hitch. There are a lot of reasons I'm glad we're swapping to Coupe Quattro running gear because this simple job would have been an impossibility with our original Ur Quattro parts. Instead of finding bearings, now the biggest challenge we face is just finding the right tool in order to press these parts together with. In this case, I'm using the perfectly sized ball joint socket from the lower control arms on the Ferrari. Thankfully, this job is done. Our bearings are inserted into the knuckles, and that means the rest of our suspension is more or less ready to go together. But we've still got bushings to press into control arms, and then control arms to fit into subframes. So let's get those subframes down out of storage, because I had to get them out of the way for these last six months. There is, however, one other issue keeping us from making forward progress. And that's the fact that the car is currently sitting on a rolling dolly. Useful for moving it around, but it makes installing subframes a complete impossibility. So for now, until we get wheels back on this thing, it's gonna be stationary once again. With the car suspended on jack stands, it should just be four bolts to drop the rear subframe. 
With any luck, we got everything else disconnected previously, and even the brakes and their hydraulic lines should stay suspended with the car. The only real question is, can I keep the entire rear subframe with the diff and axles suspended and balanced on a single jack on its way down? All right, maybe it's optimistic, but hopefully that's it. Against my better judgment, that's exactly what I tried, and it went okay. The problem was that in my lack of understanding these cars intimately, I left one of the cables hooked up to the differential, I believe to be part of the diff locking system. I tried my best to separate the cable from the system itself, but it proved to be a bit too corroded to come apart. So my ultimate solution was to just remove the entire assembly from the differential and, well, when in doubt, figure it out later. That we are officially free. Easiest subframe removal ever. Let's pull it out. And from beginning to end, it was a process that took maybe 20 minutes. One of the easiest jobs on this thing so far, and I gotta give Audi a nod. This thing seems reasonably serviceable, ignoring the parts availability side of things. This was easier to do than it would be on a BMW. But now comes reassembly. We've got our bushings, control arms, and subframes, and a lot of parts to reassemble and put on the car. But before we assemble all this stuff, I have to remember how it all goes together. I'm definitely gonna watch the episode where we took it all apart, because it's been forever. And part of the fun of this project is everything that I'm learning about Audis is real time for you guys. You guys are along for the ride. I don't know anything about them. I really am a complete amateur when it comes to these things. I don't know how they go together. I don't know how they come apart. It's just kind of a, a live feed into my complete amateur Audi knowledge here, but it's fun. It's something new, but truth be told, I don't remember how any of these bushings get oriented in here. I don't know how the control arms go. I'm not even positive which ones are front and rear. So we're going to watch our old footage back. Thankfully we record everything around here and we'll make sure that we put it back together the correct way or you guys are coming along for the ride and you'll watch me put it together twice. Now all of the vulcanized factory style rubber bushings are available for these control arms, but as you guys saw in the previous episode, they sure are a pain to service. So given that, and given what I want this car to be when we're done, I went out and bought some PowerFlex bushings. But I did opt for street spec stiffness. I don't want this car to feel like a race car inside. Instead, I just want to make it ride a bit firmer and sportier and give myself maximum control behind the wheel. But there is one other major perk at hand, and that's that these bushings are way easier to install. The metal housings on the OEM style are quite difficult to get into place, and even more so to get out once they've been in the car for years. These, on the other hand, not so much. So you don't really need a press for these. You could do them in a bench vise, or you could probably tap them in with a hammer. But all I'm doing is giving myself something to support. The control arm itself, I'm using a socket that I know this, the bushing can drop into. It's got to be something hollow or it'll just hit it and you can't press it all the way in. So I just grabbed a big socket, we'll line it all up, and then as you guys can see, I mean, even without any force on it at all, just turning the wheel, it's pushing in, it's super easy to do. like that, we've got a bushing pressed into place, and that's why we need a socket that allows it to drop in. So we'll flip it over, we'll do the other side, and call it done. And while I would say that an arbor press like this is super overkill for your average person, if anybody's thinking about getting one, this is my favorite tool I have ever bought. And for the rear control arms, assembly was even easier. I didn't have to put any pressure on the arbor press. The bushings just dropped into place. And no, this isn't some sort of sponsored segment. I just hate doing factory bushings more than anything, and this proved to be a great alternative. Uh, 
Another major step closer towards getting this car back down on the ground, we've got all of our bushings installed on the control arms, and that means the control arms can get installed into our new subframes. In my eyes, it's easier to do it this way than to fight with the control arms while the subframes are inverted on the car. As it turns out, this was a pretty good plan because getting the bushings into place with the plastic washers that PowerFlex demands be in there, well, it was kind of a pain in the backside. They kept wanting to pop out, and this became a project that required more hands than I have personally to pull off. But thanks to both Khalil and Anthony, we got the job done, we have a subframe fully assembled, and now it's ready to go back on the car. Given how streetable I want this thing to be, I would normally be opposed to something like solid subframe bushings, but the rest of the Audi community tells me that in this car's case, they don't really increase NVH. And that makes sense given that the control arms are bushed directly to the subframe itself. So I'm just gonna reuse the 034 Motorsports solid bushings from our old subframes. For the back end of the car, I'm happy to say that the control arms slid into the rear subframe substantially easier. I'm gonna wait to torque everything down until it's all on the car for the final time because who knows, I might still have to remove all of this stuff at some point. But for now, the rear subframe is also assembled and ready to be installed meaning yet another critical step closer towards setting this car back down on the ground. The Audi's on jack stands because I didn't want to tie up the lift with an inoperable car, but the trade-off means doing this on my back on the floor the old-fashioned way. If you guys don't mind, I'd prefer to attribute this to something cool, like I want to remember my roots or where I came from, instead of something more mundane like I'm bad at project planning or just too stubborn to clear the lift two feet away. Next on our parts list is of course a set of H&R coilovers, and these coilovers were a huge part of why we decided to change all of our running gear to begin with. The original Urquattro parts would have been a huge pain to modify in contrast to these bolt-on solutions that are for an S2. As a result, mating the knuckle to the coilover is merely a two-bolt affair. We'll then mount the lower ball joint to the knuckle itself and the top of the coilover to our replacement camber plates. At least that's what I'll call them, but Audi guys probably have a different name. These aren't outright adjustable, but they will give us some added camber and I can only assume this car will benefit from it. But if not, well, we'll deal with that later. Our knuckles are mounted to the coilovers, our camber plates are in place, now we just need to fit our lower ball joints so the whole thing can go together. Alright, when it comes to these lower ball joints, none of this stuff is easy to find. I mean, I guess it's relatively easy, but nothing like a BMW. I ordered all the same brand stuff, these are both Delphi pieces, it was the only brand I could find that had all of the same ball joints. And they show up, and this one's nice and chunky and reinforced. And this one's so dainty looking and they're the same thing. And that's so frustrating because like this one's thinner in material. I need a pair of these, these big badass ones. Just Audi things, vintage Audi part things sends you nuts that are supposed to go with this and they don't thread onto the control arm. I want to say that I'm surprised, but I'm not, because this is a really cool car, but every step of the way of just like trying to figure out, I don't know, just parts and how to get them, where they're from, acquiring them. I mean, I'm putting B5 S4 hubs on this car, not S4, B5 A4 hubs, rear hubs on this car to convert it to 50114. That's a car from as recent as 2002. That's like a new car to me. That's a really new car. The hub's completely unavailable. You can't buy those anywhere. You gotta go to a junkyard. That's insane. How can you have a car from 2002 you can't buy parts for? And it makes me realize us BMW guys really have it good for parts for our cars. 
But if the parts availability isn't simple enough for these cars, at least the parts installation is. I do like the way these things are constructed, and it was easy to replace them now and again in the future. With everything in place, the coilovers can finally be mounted to the car itself. Although, at first glance, it does look like I might have to modify the steering arm that's part of the coilover itself in order to play nicely with the tie rod ends, or vice versa. Otherwise though, as promised and as advertised, all of our B3 parts bolted up to this early chassis without a hitch. That does mean though, we need to turn our attention to the wheel hubs. These are also going to come from late model Audis. These hubs were sent over by my Audi mentor and the guru himself, Dave Pecoraro, and along with them, all of the knowledge we need in order to modify these things to work on our Quattro. For starters, we've got to get the old bearing races off of them, but thankfully a little bit of heat did the trick. But before we actually install the front hubs, we've got to go across the street and visit Les and Brett. We could suffer through putting a step on the backside of these hubs so they will clear the knuckle itself on my lathe, but I don't have good tooling for steel and I still don't really know what I'm doing. It would be a mess. So let's take it to somebody who actually can do this. They'll do it effectively and Brett's gonna make it look a lot better than we would. To put it simply, these hubs need a step machined in the backside in order to clear the knuckle. They aren't meant to go on this car, but they will work. So I've brought it over to Nimmo Machine. Chances are you've probably heard about these guys in previous episodes, but if not, to put it simply, this is a special, special place. It's run by Les Nimmo, who's got more talent in his pinky than you and I put together. And then we've got Brett Walker. And if you're not familiar, over the last 10 years, I have yet to be able to stump him with a single problem. So he's the guy I call when I mess up or when there's something I don't think I can solve on my own. Thankfully, machining the backs of these hubs is going to be about as simple as it gets for Brett. This is one very basic operation. So after getting these things cleaned up, he got them clamped in his lathe and got to work. These hubs fit our coupe quattro knuckles other than having too big of a shelf on the backside. They've got to get clearance so they can fit within the throat of the knuckle itself. If that's tough to follow verbally, you'll see the finished product here in a moment. For those of you that are worried this might make the part weak, well, there are a lot of Audi guys out there running these on some crazy high horsepower cars, so I'm not worried in the least. On top of that, if it gets the Brett stamp of approval and he's willing to do the job, I can usually rely on the fact that it's going to be safe. At least, so far, Brett, if you're watching, let's keep that tally running. Here, you can see the finished machine shelf in the backside of these hubs. It's a pretty straightforward operation. These are ready to go on the car, so now we just need to wait for the rears to show up. So in the meantime, let's do some 3D scanning. Now the problem we're gonna face at the moment is the fact that 3D scanners don't like scanning reflective objects and paint is quite reflective. They sell expensive sprays that you can buy that kind of help with this, that essentially you spray on and they turn the whole thing kind of matte or put a fine powder on it. But those are expensive. And I read online that you can use alcohol and baby powder and mix them together. I have no idea what ratio, I looked for like two seconds before I got impatient. I'm not a patient man. So we're just gonna mix some in this bottle here and spray it and see how it works. Hope for the best. Maybe this does the trick, maybe it doesn't. We just dump baby powder directly on the car. I don't know. Here we go. Bro, this is definitely not working. I have just made a pay, this is, all right, this isn't, did not work. Uh, maybe wrong ratio, maybe too much baby powder. Right now it's just like a solid block maybe to here with like alcohol up to here and now it's just kind of cakey. I need better instructions. When in doubt, yeah, when in doubt, more alcohol. It's better. You're a natural.
The art of the spray, hey baby. This part was about as fun as watching paint dry. For a while, we thought our mixed solution straight up wasn't gonna work. But over the next 15 or 20 minutes, the front end of the car slowly turned a chalky white, and it was clear this was gonna pan out. Now, if you missed my explanation in the previous episode, my goal here is to 3D scan the front of our Audi so that I can retrofit our own Sport Quattro nose. You see, the Sport Quattro was fitted with a slightly different front end that I personally prefer. And so I want to use our 3D scanner to bring the front end of the Audi into the computer, model it up, and design a Sport Quattro nose that will bolt into this front because a factory one simply won't. They're slightly different shapes. I'll have to learn some new skills in order to do this, and I will employ the help of our 3D printer for some prototyping. So this is a long-term idea, but it's something I want to do nonetheless, and this is the perfect way to start, because doing this the old-fashioned way would never work. I'll also need some scans with all of the grill pieces removed so I know how to mount it, but this is a good enough start. So the last step for this episode should be installing the wheel hubs that Brett just machined for us. But there's one problem and that's that these are raw steel. If I install them now just to get far enough along in the episode, they're gonna rust eventually and I'm gonna regret it a year down the line. It's worth waiting so I can send these out to get Cerakoted. We'll block off all the actual bearing mate surfaces and the Cerakote will actually be really thin. It won't change the tolerances of anything else. It's the perfect solution for this stuff, really durable. They'll look new forever. And I've got rear hubs on the way. They'll be here maybe this week, maybe next. We should send those out at the same time. It's the right way to do this. I don't want to cut corners just for an episode. Once they're back in and installed, we can finally set the car down on the ground, minus the fact that I also don't have wheels and tires for this thing. The original wheels, I think, are 4x100. They're four lug. I don't really know. I don't know much about this car. You guys get it. But these are 5 by 112 It's part of our five lug conversion here. It's like a weird Audi slash Mercedes lug pattern. I don't know. I'm gonna have to find somebody who will let me borrow some 16 inch 5x112 wheels that I can put on this thing and then start to measure for widths and offsets. I have no idea what should be on this car and I can't really Google it. We just put a bunch of late model suspension on it from a Coupe Quattro. I think that changed the track width. I'm not gonna trust anybody else's opinion. I wanna do this the right way. So I'll track down some loaner wheels and tires, but next episode, we're gonna install these guys and put it back down on the ground for the first time. And who knows how long we'll play with the ride height and figure out exactly what we want. And then we'll ask our friends at Rotoform to make us some wheels. So I'll catch you guys in the next episode for that. And maybe, just maybe, I'll make some headway on the engine. We'll have to see. I'll catch you guys then.